This is Steve Fowkes welcoming you back. Now that the foundation for energy has been laid, part four will move on to the cardiovascular system and start the discussion of the differences between the two different primary fuels, glucose and fat, which can either sabotage or restore energy production mechanisms. But first, let me take a minute to tell you how I came to be telling you this story. After my grandfather developed Alzheimer's disease while I was in college, the issue of enhancing cognitive function and reversing senility syndromes became a personal avocation for me. For 30 years, I have been searching for a solution to Alzheimer's disease. In 1993, the chapter on Alzheimer's disease in the book Smart Drugs II, The Next Generation, written with John Morgenthaler and Dr. Ward Dean, was an early attempt to provide practical advice. But it was an everything but the kitchen sink solution because we did not know what the metabolic mechanism of Alzheimer's disease was at that time. But in the late 90s, research was underway at the University of Kentucky and the University of Calgary that would end up providing the missing link to a comprehensive understanding of Alzheimer's disease culminating in 2000 and 2001 with the definitive evidence of the earliest step in the Alzheimer's disease process. By 2002, for the first time, we found out what the first domino in the Alzheimer's cascade was. Now that we know the specific details of the metabolic process, we can prevent and reverse Alzheimer's disease. Before, we could only ameliorate it. Now, we can fix it. There is lots of evidence that cardiovascular problems produce both physical and cognitive disorders. Here are some. Congestive heart failure is a crisis of the heart muscle which can respond effectively to such energy-based therapies as supplemental coenzyme Q10, a mitochondrial nutrient, and ketone fuels which are known to increase heart ejection fraction in rodents in just 30 minutes. Those people cultivating ketosis for such problems should know that IV glucose rapidly shuts down liver production of ketone fuels and should be avoided as a medical procedure unless absolutely necessary, for example, when glucose falls below 50. Blood coagulopathies can have powerful adverse effects on both physical and cognitive functions. Hypercoagulation involves high viscosity of the blood, which impairs tissue perfusion. It's like molasses in January. It takes a long time to get anything done. Sublingual, or IV heparin, reverses hypercoagulation in minutes to hours, and oral natokinase reverses hypercoagulation in hours to days. If symptoms change for the better with such therapies, hypercoagulation should be immediately suspected. Blood gas impairments can also be caused by such lung diseases as emphysema, or COPD, which are routinely diagnosed, or by blood pH stresses, which are highly unlikely to be diagnosed. The binding and release of oxygen by the hemoglobin in red blood cells is driven by minute changes in pH, and so pH disturbances can interfere with this process. The same kind of pH sensitivity occurs with hemoglobin binding and release of carbon dioxide, and pH also affects the carbon dioxide bicarbonate equilibrium, which is independent of hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is a mediator of vascular dilation and blood flow to the cerebral cortex. Deficiencies of CO2 cause decreased blood flow to the cerebral cortex without diminishing blood flow to the limbic systems and cerebellum, which impairs thinking and memory, but not emotion, motivation, and movement. This is commonly noticed during fear, phobias, panic attacks, anxiety, stage fright, and other forms of sympathetic activation, which drive shallow and rapid breathing which blows off CO2. Shallow rapid breathing and blowing off CO2 are a good thing when you are trying to outrun a bear. 
but a bad thing when you are taking a test or speaking to a group. Hiccups and tachycardia are examples of CO2 deficiency conditions, which may be more common in people with low energy metabolism and senility syndromes. Mechanical obstruction of the vascular system by plaque and clots can also cause disease and cognitive dysfunctions. Sometimes this is caused by impaired collagen maturation, which can be readily reversed by Matthias Rath's protocol involving vitamin C, lysine, and proline, or by a more comprehensive protocol that includes glycine, predigested collagen protein, bioflavonoids, transdermal copper, and oral silica. The soft tissue calcification of plaque tends to make plaque difficult to reverse, which may be addressed by magnesium, higher than RDA vitamin D, strontium, and vitamin K with or without adjunctive EDTA chelation therapy. Vasoconstriction and vasospasm are another related risk that may also derive from deficiencies of magnesium and vitamin D, and also from impaired nitric oxide production. Nitric oxide may be the active mechanism for the cognitive enhancing effects of ginkgo biloba, vimpocetine, and arginine. The key energy-related inputs of the blood are glucose and ketone fuels. Glucose is the primary, or first used, energy fuel, so let's talk about it first. Glucose is derived from dietary carbohydrates when such foods are plentiful, and from fats when carbohydrate consumption falls below energy needs. The transport of glucose from the blood into the cells is actually quite complicated, but since this is intimately associated with Alzheimer's disease, let's take a brief look. This diagram, adapted from a lead article from Nutrition Reviews in 2003, shows that glucose utilization, the cyan blue pathway, can become impaired in many ways, as indicated by the red X's. This state of glucose underutilization is called insulin resistance because something goes wrong with the insulin signal, in green, which results in inadequate mobilization of GLUT4 glucose transporters from their reservoir within the cell to the cell surface. Insulin resistance, or syndrome X, or metabolic syndrome, is most likely caused by overeating, particularly of carbohydrate-rich foods, and it is a risk factor that is well connected to senility, dementias, and Alzheimer's disease. But please note that the ketone fuel pathway, in yellow, is not subjected to any of these impairments. BHB, or beta-hydroxybutyrate, is efficiently transported straight through the cell and mitochondrial membranes where it efficiently enters the Krebs cycle. Just below BHB is acetoacetate, an archaic name for beta-ketobutyrate, which also flows straight into the energy production pathways. The opening of the ketone fuel pathways not only bypasses the energy deficits caused by insulin resistance, but it is probably one of the most efficient ways to clinically decrease insulin resistance. Now let's switch our discussion from glucose as fuel to ketones as fuel. Please start part five at this time.